everything is far from negative. The problem is that, you know, the negative, uh, it's much easier to destroy than, than to build. You have a very unique and interesting background. So would you do us a favor and introduce yourself for our audience a little about your background and what has led you to the work you're here to discuss today? And I think like one really transformative moment in my life was at the age of seven when I sort of realized that, okay, like the meat that I'm eating is indirectly contributing to potentially the suffering of, of these cute animals. So that's the first time I sort of started to think about ethics in, in general. And I think sort of the red thread in my life, that sort of escalated uh, afterwards because everyone was asking me like, why are you a vegetarian? Like, why are you not eating meat? Because back then it was not that popular. So I sort of had to dwell into ethics all the time. So that sort of became a red thread in my life. And uh, later on, as we got access to the internet, when I was like 11, 12 years old, I came across the writings of an Australian philosopher called Peter Singer. Uh, and he made the case that actually, if you want to do good for the world, you need to think about the far future as well. You need to think about future generations because the actions that we are taking today, I mean, if we are wrecking up the planet or if we die in a nuclear holocaust, like it's not going to affect just every living being today, but also in, in the far future. So I did research related to that at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute, but then ultimately decided to leave because I wanted to have a bit more of a tangible impact. So that's when I started uh, my, my business uh, normative where we essentially help large enterprises with their net zero targets, calculate their carbon emissions so they can take the right actions to go to, to net zero emissions. And now with this book, Darwinian Trap, that is going to be released in a month, I'm sort of tackling a little bit like the meta problem, because all of the big global challenges that we're seeing in the world today are just the result of coordination failure. Like it's nation states failing to coordinate. It's like enterprises failing to coordinate and we create all of these arms races where we maximize for profit in, instead of taking care of planet Earth and, and, and so on. And what piqued your interest in evolution and Darwin? I think it explains a lot about our psychology. I mean, in the end of the day, all life that is here today is here because they are optimizing for evolutionary fitness. I mean, that is the game in town, that's the only game in town. I mean, you need to survive uh, over long stretches of, of, of time. So like the way we think about things in shorter terms and short-term thinking is largely sort of an artifact of, of natural selection. And I think it explains quite well, and I'm sure that we're gonna jump into the details a lot more, like why we have this short-sightedness. Because evolution through natural selection is an optimization algorithm, but it's an optimization algorithm that is incapable of predicting consequences in the future. It's literally just selecting what is optimizing evolutionary fitness right here, right now. And if you look at that equation, it might actually optimize fitness for a nation state to build more nukes. Because then you can overpower everyone else. You can even win, you know, the Second World War. But in the long run, it's probably not optimizing fitness. You know, similarly, you know, there is these concepts in, in evolution called evolution or suicide, where you might have a certain genetic mutation that is very favorable in the short term, but in the long term, it, it leads to the species go, going extinct. But evolution can't do predictions. So that sort of explains a little bit why, why we are in this mess. Yeah, so for our audience who's not as familiar with evolutionary theory, what is the Darwinian trap that we should be aware of and how should we look at it? So what is natural selection? So let's say, for instance, that you have a population of, of mice and the color of the mice is coded into genes. Like it can be brown or it can be gray. There might be random mutations that take them in a certain direction. But that direction might 
cause them to blend in better or worse with the environment. And there's predator birds on top. So the mice that have a color that blends into the environment will be selected for over time. So having the right color to be camouflaged in the environment is sort of an adaptive trait. But if you look at sort of the broader picture, like if you look at, for instance, nation states, I mean, in order to survive as a nation state over the long run, you need to have resources. You need to have land and you need to have resources. But there's limited amounts of, of resources. So, so that creates sort of a selection pressure for nation states to develop like more and more dangerous weapons. So, I mean, the first tribes, they had, uh, you know, like, I don't know, stone tools where potentially you could, you know, kill one person in and then if you develop like a sword for instance like you know some nation states or like tribes discovered oh steel that's actually super useful technology and then they could overpower everyone else or mongols discovering oh horse by back archery is super powerful so now we can build an empire around this new technology so they're evolving to become more and more dangerous these technologies like from the first you know sword to like nuclear weapons and there doesn't seem to be a stop in that evolution because um i mean you need more dangerous and more capable weapons than than your adversaries in in, in order to survive like similar to how the mice need a good camouflage to to survive as we progress the ways that we protect ourselves tend to get a little bit more advanced wouldn't it be safe to say that this new technology that we are all talking to uh, each other has also come into play as an advancement in our defenses in for the nation state cyber warfare those those types of things where perhaps setting off a nuke right it may protect uh us from a, an enemy however it also eradicates everything the the infrastructure and everything else of of those people or or nation state whereas the more advanced stuff right? Maybe great at changing minds or creating a, a, a narrative that can protect us. For sure. I mean, I think that's, that's what I'm hoping for. And something that I talk quite a bit about is differential technological development. So, I mean, ideally, some technologies are sort of dual use. Let's say, you know, nukes, for instance. I mean, that's based on quantum mechanics. So you can use like quantum properties to create nuclear uh, power, which is like great for the world, but it's also dual use. You can create like nuclear weapons. Same thing with artificial intelligence. You can use it to cure cancer, hopefully in the future, uh, but you could also use it to create like new dangerous pathogens and potentially engineered uh, pandemics. So ideally in society, if you forecast the future, you wanna develop technologies that are defensive in nature first. So, I mean, for instance, we're developing quantum computers now that might break like all of cryptography globally. So before we roll that out, we probably want to uh, develop like quantum cryptography where all of our data is safe. So there is a certain sort of order of technological development that needs to happen for, for everyone to be safe from these like Darwinian competitive demons where we're just incentivized to roll things out like really, really quickly instead of thinking. So I, I want to highlight that I think like technologies can be absolutely amazing, but they need to be sort of deployed in the right sequence and in an incentive environment where where uh, they actually create a, a good outcome, right? And these forces, they can obviously multiply to the level of nation state, but they're also happening at our own personal level. And you mentioned Darwinian demons. What are these Darwinian angels and demons that we should be aware of that influence our behavior based on this evolutionary wiring? Yeah, like great question. I mean, they're operating at so many different levels. They're operating at nation states, they're operating at enterprises. I mean, they're operating even within like your own workplace, for instance. I mean, I think most people can sort of identify with a situation where, you know, several teams might be in competition with, with uh, over resources or might, you know, uh, recognize a situation where, oh, this idiot colleague got promoted and I've been busting my ass off. Like, what, why am I not getting promoted? 
And that's sort of back to the selection pressures again. It might actually be sort of the most effective way to get a promotion might be to just nag. You know, you, you nag your boss, uh, like, I want this promotion. But, you know, the people that are staying, you know, silent and, and getting the job done, they're, they're not getting the promotion. So that's, again, you know, sort of this Darwinian demon where there might be a selection pressure for, you know, nagging. And that might be the adaptive behavior instead of like actually doing, you know, good, good work. So a way to sort of, you know, prevent that from happening is to set up the right type of accounting and, and measurements where you actually like set up, for instance, a great performance framework where you objectively try to sort of identify who is performing in the business and who is not performing in the business. I mean, I personally, like having <laughs> run my business for quite some time, I, I have, yeah, painful personal experience with actually like promoting the, the, the wrong people. And it was such a big change getting my head of HR on board, like say she was saying, you're doing it all wrong. Like you need a freaking framework to, to prevent those, uh, you know, sort of Darwinian demons for, for happening. I mean, she didn't obviously not use that, that terminology. So, I mean, that's, that's just one example, but you can see them in everyday life as well. Like, I mean, police forces that are like a little bit too eager to sort of give you a ticket because they have some sort of, you know, ticketing quota uh, that they have to, to reach. Uh, so they're a little bit too zealous instead of, you know, protecting and, and guarding and building relationships with, with their uh, com communities, for instance. But that's again, you know, going back to selecting the right success metrics. In this situation, like the narrow success metric of, okay, you need to get more money into the county as a police officer through ticketing is probably like the wrong success metric. And similarly, like in global politics, like the only success metric is freaking winning the election. So, I mean, if you can manipulate your way through like fake news or like very hyper partisan politics and like, oh, the other guy is totally evil and everything is going to go to shit if you vote for that person. Like, I mean, that is a selected trait. So over time, you know, politicians will become more and more zealous and they might, you know, do gerrymandering and, and that sort of stuff. So I think we see sort of some of these phenomena everywhere. But in order for these like Darwinian demon selection pressures to be curbed, like we, we need like to measure what we actually intrinsically value. So many of our listeners are most likely not in politics or in nuclear fission or working on developing the arms race of AI. Instead, they're looking at this work competition. And in any of these situations where there is a competition set up, there's going to be these selection pressures working towards the outcomes that we either measure or incentivize knowingly, consciously or unconsciously. And oftentimes when we're in these situations, it can be difficult when we aren't the ones who are setting the rules to deal with those who are playing by the rules and then often breaking the rules due to the selection pressure to, again, seek that promotion, as you said. And when we're not in a leadership role, how can we identify those pressures that are working against us and, and those pressures that might actually be working in our favor? That's such a great question. I think the first thing that you want to recognize is that most people are not evil. Most people don't want to be evil. So that annoying colleague that might be, you know, sucking up to the boss as the best way of getting the promotion, that is just the system being broken. Like it's not anyone's fault. It's just the system being broken. And I think like even if you're not in a leadership position, like having that attitude that the system is a little bit broken can make a difference. Then you can start to think about, okay, these frameworks that we have in place to you know, incentivize certain behaviors like bonuses, for instance, are we measuring the right thing around those frameworks? Or like our performance and growth frameworks in the company, like are we actually sort of measuring the right thing to ensure that you know, everyone is collaborating across teams where you know, the marketing team might be incentivized to get shifty leads to the sales team because all you're measured from is like total number of leads, for instance. And that happens in so many organizations. So I think it's just recognizing like there is no evil people here. Like the boss is not evil. Your colleague is not evil. Like the systems are just broken. So let's sit down and talk about how the system is broken. And let's have a talk about like what is that if that we actually value in this organization? I mean, what is our mission and how can we break that down into sort of 
you know, metrics that we can all agree on. You mentioned that in setting up your business originally in that inexperience showing, can you explain what the mistakes were that you made that uh, allowed the system to have those failures? Oh yeah. I mean, I made so many mistakes when I set up the organization, I was quite naive. Like I thought about, okay, let's, let's just do it. Let's just get a bunch of friends on board and let's just, you know, start this thing which is, you know, fantastic. But it, for instance, meant that in the beginning, like I selected more for the excitement of people <laughs> rather than like actual skills. That's sort of, you know, not number one, uh, I would say. So, so like performance and performance and growth frameworks is the second one. So I just talked about sort of hiring, like what, what are you actually optimizing for in the hiring? Are you optimizing for super likable people that are, passionate about what you do or are you optimizing for like domain specific skills so having like the right frameworks for for hiring and then secondly i think the frameworks for for performance once you are on board like how can you ensure that you know we're all working together as a team so like one thing for instance is like i mean sales is the lifeblood of any business so you typically have like a marketing team that create a bunch of leads through performance marketing or events. And that lead, if it's qualified, it's sort of handed over to people in the sales team that have a demo or something. Uh, and then if the deal is closed, it's, it's handed over to, to people in the customer success team. So, I mean, one thing that we didn't have early on, for instance, is, okay, like we are all incentivized around, you know, the total funnel. So, I mean, we sort of set up frameworks where, okay, the marketing people, like they're incentivized for, you know, bringing in sort of more leads. But if they're just bringing in more leads, then you can sort of hack the system by, you know, qualifying those leads in sort of a very ambiguous way where, oh, they're absolutely fantastic, but actually they're not interested in the product, which means that, you know, when they show up, uh, the salespeople show up, like they're not converting in the next stage of the funnel. So that's, that's also sort of, you know, an, another, I think, mistake, like not having company wide metrics where we are all like incentivized to, to reach a certain outcome. So right now, like our North Star metric is emissions reduction. And then we sort of, you know, break that down into, you know, okay, in order to achieve that, we need to sell. We need new customers. We also need like existing employees to be happy, like, you know, EMPS, like, employee in that promoter score. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I think we have that a bit better as well. So I think those those things like have common metrics aligned with your overall corporate mission where everyone is incentivized to work as a team and then having the right sort of metrics in your hiring practices and like performance and growth practices. Yeah, I know for us in our history, when we started, we were very successful running small free seminars in New York City. And those attendees would in turn sign up for our programs at about 30 to 35 percent. So we got really excited and we said, well, we need to host more of these in-person events. So we printed a bunch of color flyers and we had a bunch of interns and their incentive originally was to give out as many flyers as possible. So you could imagine they go to the subway, they're dumping loads of flyers all over town. And then what do you know? No one shows up with flyers in hand. Well, we realized we had the wrong incentives. We just told them, get rid of as many flyers, not actually get attendees. So then we changed the incentive and we said, OK, well, we actually want the attendee to say who brought them here. So who they got the flyer from. So sure enough, we had lines of people showing up, but they were unqualified, meaning not interested in any coaching, no idea why they were there. They were arms were twisted to get them in the room. And of course, we still weren't meeting our company goals. But if you set up the wrong incentives, even when the team is meeting those incentives, it's very disheartening to then say, OK, we set up the wrong incentives. What we asked you to do yesterday, we don't want you to do today. So it really requires you to be thoughtful in the setting up of those incentives and the impact that they have on the team when you set up the wrong incentives and you recognize not only does it hurt the business, but it hurts morale. It hurts the team because they're trying to do everything they can based on the selection pressures that you've set up internally to perform at their best, to get promoted, to be recognized. And oftentimes if those aren't set up properly, you can set the business astray and you can defeat the morale of the team. Yeah, totally. 100%. I mean, that's, that's such a good story. 
And I mean, the thing is that, you know, I think most people will tend to sort of point fingers and blame, like, you know, why the fuck are you just leaving those flyers on the street? I mean, that's not what I meant. But I mean, I don't think it's shame on them. Like, they're actually smart for doing that. I mean, it's it's shame on you for setting up the wrong incentives in the first place. Uh, so I think like that sort of, you know, external finger pointing of, you know, bad apples, like they're actually just being smart. And I think one of the more fun examples of this is uh, something called the Cobra effect. And there is like a similar thing in like colonial Vietnam under French rule. But the cobra effect, it sort of happened in, in, in India that there were so many cobras killing people. The British were tired of it. Of, okay, let's just crowdsource this thing. For every dead cobra you're going to hand in, you're going to get some money from us. And then obviously people recognize that, oh, setting up cobra farms is super profitable because then I can hand in like dead cobra after dead cobra after dead cobra. And eventually the British is, is catching up to the scheme and they're like, you know, shutting down the incentives, at which point having cobra farms is not profitable. So then they let all of the cobras loose. <laughs> so they actually end up with more cobras in the, in the first place. Uh, and it's, the, I think it's sort of the first textbook example of these like perverse incentives. But I mean, they're everywhere. They're in our workplace. They're in our global politics. They're in local politics. I mean, they're just everywhere. And we need to recognize and have sort of this literacy of, Okay, people are not evil. Don't point fingers. Like the, the system is to blame. You know, like, uh, yeah. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. Human beings are also programmed to find the easy way to conserve energy. So if they're going to look for loopholes and or uh, hacks any way that they can, it's DNA. It's programmed into us. In fact, those are the Darwinian selectives that that allowed us to be here. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like. Taking shortcuts is such a big part of, of nature. I mean, we need to freaking preserve energy. Like what we have today with like global societies and agriculture and safety and all of that, like we did not have that back in the days. Like having this big freaking brain taking like 25% of our resources was a huge freaking gamble back then. So just like finding the easiest and simplest ways of, you know, uh, getting food and resources and everything else that you need to survive is just 100 percent, you know, natural. So are there instances where this short sightedness works to our advantage? Oh, yeah, definitely. But it typically doesn't work for our advantage in, in the long run. Right. I mean, there's examples both on a very local level and global level. I mean, on a global level, like, OK, you had sort of the arms race, the Germans versus the uh, U.S., like going to nuclear weapons first. Like if we're not building the nukes, the Germans are going to build the nukes. Uh, the fact that, you know, the U.S. got there first, uh, end of the world war, like a lot earlier and, and probably, you know, saved lives in the short run. But it also set up this larger chain reaction in the long term, where now more and more nation states are, are having nukes and like the probability, the annual probability of nuclear war is like probably around like 1%. And if you compound that over time, there is like, you know, probably like a 50% probability that there will be some sort of nuclear war in the, in the next year. So I think it's all about time scale, right? I think these sort of, you know, more selfish, short-sighted drives is like 100% adaptive in the short run. Like it's, it's, it's great in the short run, but, but sometimes in the long run, it, it doesn't work. But, but then there's like obviously beneficial things that are both good in the short term and, and long term. I mean, those, those things obviously exist as well. I mean, I think like probably like building civilizations with, with nice houses and agriculture and like medicine and that sort of stuff is like, you know, it's, it's both good in, in the short term and, and long term. Yeah. So the, these selective pressures are not all negative. I know we've, sort of rabble roused around a lot of scary things, arms race, nuclear weapons and destruction. But there are certainly those incentives working in a positive way, as you said, setting up civilization, medicine, advancements in agriculture that in the short term were impactful, but then in the long term are even more impactful that allow us now to live in a state of abundance. Whereas a lot of these evolutionary pressures that we're talking about were in a time of complete scarcity. 
So it's not that we actually want to be lazy. It's that, well, we have to conserve energy because we don't have a farm growing next door. We don't have access to resources and conservation of those resources is incredibly important to our survival. Yeah, totally. I mean, 100 percent. I mean, it's everything is far from negative. Uh, the problem is that, you know, the negative side of things, it's, it's much easier to destroy than, than to build. Like, I mean, if you have a bunch of Lego bricks in a big box and if you shake it up, like you're more likely going to get, you know, this order, like, you know, high entropy states. And it's like incredibly unlikely that it's going to build like the Empire State Building or, or, or something like that. So in some regard, we sort of have entropy uh, working against us because it's much che cheaper to sort of, you know, blow something up and destroy it rather than, than, than building it, uh, which is quite uh, unfortunate. How should we approach these as we look to the future, looking now in a state of abundance that we live in? Advancements in technology have created so many more opportunities for us, but these selective pressures and these downstream effects of our short-sightedness still present themselves in negative ways. I think we need to not fool ourselves because, I mean, we have lived in an enormous era of peace and prosperity. And I think that peace and prosperity is largely because of U.S. hegemony, like for good and for bad. Like the fact that we have had since the fall of the Soviet Union, like one global power, there's only been one power game in, in town, more or less. Uh, that has created like unprecedented stability. But then there is also a part of the growth. Like we have some technologies that we discovered. I mean, we discovered electromagnetism and that enabled a bunch of new technologies. We discovered you know, transportation and communication and satellites. So that led to a huge economic growth. But now what we're seeing is that, you know, it's somewhat stagnant. It's, it's almost like we have, um, you know, squeezed every drop out of those technologies where we can't expect sort of, you know, growth and abundance to continue for, for infinity. Uh, so as like growth is slowing off, there is sort of this real concern of how are things shared like equitably between different people uh, within different walks of life, et cetera, et cetera, in order to sort of have a, a safe, a prosperous future where we don't see, you know, uh, huge revolutions and so on. But to sort of answer your question, what, what, what is the solution here? I think we need to think hard about what is it that we actually intrinsically value here, right? Because as soon as we have sort of these proxy metrics, like, you know, it might be a profit or it might be power or it might be, you know, a bunch of different, you know, metrics. We need to think hard about what is it that we intrinsically value. And at least to me, it sort of boils down to, let's say I want to get a car. I might ask myself, OK, why do, do I want this fancy car? I mean, maybe it's because I want to feel part of a group. I want to impress people. Why do I want to impress people? Because, you know, being social and having friends is nice. And why is it nice? Because it makes me happy. Why do I want to be happy? Oh, because happy is good in and of itself. Like it's great in and of itself if I'm happy and, and other people are happy. And by asking that question, why, 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 I converge towards like what my intrinsic value was. And for me, that intrinsic value is like, I think we should, you know, optimize for happiness of sentient beings. Like someone else might converge towards like, actually, I think nature, has it is beautiful in and of itself, and we need to preserve it at, at all costs. But we need to have like conversations around like what is it that we intrinsically value and, and try to collectively optimize around that. Because otherwise you will sort of have a similar situation that you told about with the flyers. Like you had the wrong metric, you know, so people are just dumping the flyers like wherever because they got rid of them. And and right now, like sort of Profit maximization is a little bit like the equivalent of, of, of that because we're not measuring what we intrinsically value. So is the argument then it's more difficult to measure these things and that's why we default to the more easy measurements? Uh, obviously, with financial markets, profit is fairly easy to measure. Global happiness is quite a difficult measure with our current technology. So is that one of the reasons that we default to these rudimentary incentives that work against us? Yeah, I think so. I think that's one of the reasons for sure. But then also like some of those more rudimentary metrics seems to be more sort of correlated with power. 
and power is sort of adapted for in, in, in the long run, right? If, if you have like a billion dollars, then you can buy much more power for a billion dollars than if you have the currency of, you know, uh, the happiness of like 1000 people or something. So sort of, you know, over time, like these Darwinian drives and selection pressures will sort of select for money because it's more orthogonal to power and the survival of nation states or, or people who sort of wield it. So that's one thing, but I think the measuring problem is, is, is the other big thing. I think the measurement problem, however, like we can solve through digital technology. Like, uh, and, and one example that I bring up in my book is sort of the idea of so-called reputational markets, where you know everyone in the world can participate in these markets. They can vote on what is it that I intrinsically value. And then similar to sort of the sports betting where you bet on, okay, is this team going to win or is this team going to win? But instead you bet on, okay, how well is company X, Y, and Z or like the strategy of Donald Trump versus uh, Kamala Harris? Uh, how well are they going to, you know, stack up and instantiate those things that we intrinsically value and, and sort of both it on? So that's the entire idea. So I think like through digital technology and some clever mechanism design, we can set up sort of the uh, the right systems where we measure the right things and where we actually like put some sort of reputational score on uh, powerful politicians and nation states and, and enterprises in terms of like their perceived ability to to actually instantiate those things that we we intrinsically value. So looking at the measurement problem as one area, but also what you talked about is this human desire for power and that overwhelming any measurement that we might um, game for or create incentives for. So how do you see that human desire for power influencing a reputational score, whether it be decentralized or centralized? Nobody really has power. And what I mean by that is that the world is so incredibly interconnected. So, I mean, the people in power have power because all of the other people that have power, like, I mean, you have power, I have power, everyone has at least a little bit of power. They agreed that, you know, it's, it's okay for you to sort of have the ultimate power and, and, and the ultimate say. So we do not yet have any agents with ultimate power where you don't need anyone else. Like to the contrary, like supply chains and value chains and all goods that are created in the world economies highly, highly complex with thousands and ten thousands of individuals and technologies and capital from all of the across the world be, being a, a part of its creation. So I bring up this example in the book of there is this guy from YouTube. He wanted to create the chicken sandwich from scratch. And it sounds easy. You just grab a bit of chicken from the fridge and some butter or whatever, and you make the sandwich. But truly making it from scratch means like, growing the grain, you know, milling it, and you can't mill it with modern technologies. You have to do it with like sort of stone tool technology because you want to do it completely independent of anyone else. And same thing, you need to grow the chicken and uh, it ended costing him like $1,500 and six months of work to just create a simple chicken sandwich. So that just sort of highlights how highly interconnected everything is in the world economy. So I think if we could have these reputational markets where that interconnectivity were displayed and suppliers of like a big enterprise, if, if evil oil company Inc. is doing something evil and then everyone knows about it, then the suppliers could say like, hey, I don't want no longer want to be a part of this because maybe they are afraid that if they don't sanction the evil oil company, their suppliers in turn or their employees will not be a part of them. I think you can sort of create this new equilibria where reputation in terms of how well you instantiate these values actually matter. And if you don't do the right thing and you try to overpower everyone else, you're going to get sanctioned because your power is not real. It's fictitious. Actually, in reality, it is distributed. But that's one of the things that sort of worry me with, you know, artificial intelligence, but overall, like trends of concentration of, of, of power, like, you could imagine like a godlike AI where it's just so powerful that it's not dependent on anyone else whatsoever. And I think that's a little bit uh, dangerous. Yeah, I, I think 
from outside looking in, in all of these situations, the human desire for power is leading the charge in many of these advancements. So on the one hand, that desire for power has created these advancements in technology that we talk about to create the $5 chicken sandwich instead of the $1,500. It has allowed for an increase in human productivity and output that has allowed for all of those resources to be shared in a more meaningful manner that it doesn't cost you that much to produce these items and goods and be able to consume and participate in the market. At the same time, getting everyone to agree on a reputational market and participate in it with that drive to power being a big part of the reason why we're in this situation with nation states and wars and conflict over resources that might appear abundant to some but scarce to others. It feels tricky to me to centralize and create a reputational score that we could all agree on and not compete against the, those incentives. I want to add to that too. I think it's our drive for power that has created uh, some of these tools. So now that they're, they've been created, now I'm going to ask you to give up some of your power in order for everyone to, to be able to use it and, 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 and showcase a little bit of power of their own. Now, if I spent all that, those resources and time and effort in order to build that, I'm going to tell you no. So we, we have a, a stalemate, right? And so, of, of course, it's going to be might makes right when it comes down to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, I'm not disagreeing with anything that you're saying. I think, like, power has been, like, a force for good as well, right? I mean, building new technologies. I mean, to quote Gordon Gecko, like, from, from, you know, Wall Street, it's like, you know, greed, greed is good. And I think there has been some elements of, of greed being good for sure, like greed for love, greed for wealth, the greed for like the good things in, in, in life. Uh, and it has inspired people to, to build some really, really, really amazing things. So when I talk about power in reputational markets, I don't talk, I'm not talking about it from a centralized point of view, quite the opposite. I think where things can go wrong is if someone, a centralized authority says, oh, this is the new success metric right now, and they didn't think about the success metric carefully enough, and then they're centrally enforcing that on everyone else, and, and then it just goes horribly wrong. So what I'm talking about here is distributed power, because like every single supplier, every single employee, like the whole machinery is working because like everyone is contributing to that machinery. So I think like the realization that you actually have a little bit of power and you as a supplier have a little bit of power, like you as employees or whoever has a little bit of power. And that bigger power that you're a part of is, is, is existing because of your contribution. And you can actually say no, because, okay, what you're doing here does not correspond to like the, the values that, that we agreed upon. So I think that would be sort of an ideal scenario, which is a little bit utopic, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to, uh, think a little bit more about it beyond the, the book in the future. So it feels to me that in a lot of ways, this is what cryptocurrency is moving towards, right? This ability to decentralize and create a unit of value outside of governments and outside forces that carries weight and reputation across country boundaries, outside of markets, inside of markets that we all agree on in a decentralized way. And you're now believe that if we were to create a reputational market on top of that infrastructure, that decentralization, that could create the next level and move beyond the incentive problem. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think blockchain can be so incredibly powerful. Um, I mean, you can build in sort of some of the, you know, values and the beliefs uh, as, you know, prediction markets on, on the blockchain. You could create like smart contracts around, you know, particular outcomes. You could tokenize those outcomes in a decentralized manner. So I, I think there are some real opportunities here to sort of, you know, build a new decentralized system of, uh, of governance if you build sort of the right mechanism design. And I just think it's like so incredibly cool. Like if you take blockchain, it's just a tiny freaking piece of code. And we don't even know who it is that deployed that piece of code in the world. But into that piece of code were incentives for mining, uh, incentives for transactions. And that incentive design meant that, okay, all of a sudden, you know, 
hundreds of millions of people are using it, like without anyone forcing them to, um, and without a marketing department, without a sales department, or or anything else. So I think that idea is incredibly powerful because, like existing power structures, it's against their incentives to give up that power, right? I mean, that's why like a globalized UN that has some sort of policing does not exist. I mean, the easiest way to get rid of the climate problems would be, okay, the UN police is going to arrest the world leaders that don't achieve their climate targets, like problem solved. But no world leader in the right mind would give that power to the UN because it's like against their self-interest to give up power to a new centralized authority. And I mean, eventually, I think maybe through evolution, through natural selection, like something like the EU might like grow organically over time because more and more states see the advantages of being a part of the single market. And it might become sort of, you know, a global government over time. But we don't, we don't have time for that. Like that is a risky gamble. We need to create the new system of, of governance that is. Uh, decentralized and replacing the old systems to some extent, which might sound super naive, and it probably is, but I'm I'm, I'm excited for it. I, I see the the challenge, and I want to make sure that for our our audience that it is it is clear. So let me summarize what I'm getting. You tell me if I have this correct. We have all these great technologies. Everyone is already using them, and and the where they can take us. It's totally unclear. However, if we get together, we'll be able to, to see some great stuff. However, the problem, as always, is human beings communicating with each other in order of, of how we are going to use these technologies. Therefore, the, the only thing that is stopping us, our hurdle, is our cooperation. Do I have that correct? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's more or less correct. I mean, I think all of the global dilemmas that we're facing, it's just cooperation failures. It's just a version of sort of the prisoner's dilemma of the or the tragedy of the commons where individual actors are incentivized to defect and engage in arms race dynamics instead of reaching like a Pareto optimal equilibria that you could reach if you just you know collaborate and cooperate together. So how then can we get to a more collaborative, cooperative state? Yeah, that's, that is, I think, reputational markets is one technology that could bring us in that direction. I think we need a lot more sort of technological bets on, you know, how, I mean, it should totally be like a venture capital category, like coordination technologies that sort of avoid these multipolar traps or Darwinian demons. So that should be one thing. But I think secondly, like, I think everyone in our everyday life should stop with all of the finger pointing and sort of introspect and look at what system are causing those problems. And is there something that I can do in my life to change that system? I mean, you might be able to change the dynamic in your family and your team at work and maybe less so uh, in sort of global governments, which is completely fine because where you are is affecting you the most, right? And if, if you can make that change, it, it can make it a, a huge uh, difference. That being said, I think we need to try many things in parallel. Like I would love to see a situation where the UN can actually impose sanctions on, you know, more crimes or like shitty things happening, but I don't think it will happen anytime soon. But I applaud like all of those people who want to, you know, reform the, the UN and the uh, Security Council and, and all of that stuff as well. And coming out of the pandemic, I feel that one of the other forces that arose was the the fraying of globalism in terms of international trade lines, our ability to get supplies. All of that was put under immense tension and pressure and stress, causing a lot of dysregulation in the markets, costs soaring in some areas. And there's now been a movement to more localize a lot of these resources instead of depending on global supply chains. So how do you see rising above that selection pressure that's now arisen from the pandemic? Yeah, it's so complex and multifaceted. Like I see a lot of good things in it. I see a lot of bad things in it. I mean, for instance, like a lot of climate tech investments. And if you take the like Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, I mean, that's fundamentally a protectionist policy. Like we're going to build like climate capabilities here in the US to be less reliant on, you know, others for, you know, energy or solar panels or anything else. And I think that's great because now we're finally investing in climate and, you know, the preventing the destruction of like 
future species and ecosystems and climate catastrophes. But then there is also the element of, you know, with more and more protectionism and more and more things being localized, we're less dependent on one each other. Like, I think it's to some extent great that the US is dependent on China uh, for a lot of shit that they produce. I mean, they produce a lot of great stuff. So I meant like shit more metaphorically, uh, but there is a lot of shit as well. And the same thing, like China being dependent on US consumers is, is, is great because it's sort of this social contract where it would be prohibitively costly to go to war. But as sort of you just focus on your domestic production and you're less globally interconnected and interdependent, like the incentive structure changes. Uh, and, and, and the cost of going to war is actually quite a bit lower. So I think it is complex and multifaceted. Like I love the Inflation Reduction Act, but I also see some worries around the trend of everything being hyper-localized. And where do you see us going from here in terms of technology advancement? So one of the, the key areas in the book that you talk about and you touched on a little bit here was AI. And obviously, we're in a, a very modern arms race around AI being developed across multiple nation states, uh, very active in Silicon Valley in the U.S., but happening all over the world. So with that comes great power and great responsibility on the other side of wielding that power. Um, now that we're in this development phase, how do you propose we tackle AI? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, it is, we are in the middle of an arms race right now. I mean, we have companies that are racing for AI supremacy. And it's so freaking interesting to see, like, I mean, and, and I've, I've, I've met like mo most of the leaders of, of these companies. I can't say that we're, you know, close friends, but I've met them. And I truly, truly believe that, you know, their hearts are in the right place and they want to do the right thing. But it's so interesting to see because there were two statements like released sort of roughly at the same time. Like one statement was around like artificial intelligence being an existential risk, similar to global pandemics and nuclear war. And all of the leaders of the big AI labs signed on to that. They were acknowledging that this is like potentially an existential risk, like a few years down the line. And then there was this other statement around pausing development to let governance catch up. And nobody signed that. So it's just Again, sort of the dissonance, we think that this is existential, but we're not willing to pause because it's arms race dynamics again. Like whoever pauses is going to lose and they know that they're going to lose. So the only choice that you have is to race ahead. Uh, and right now, like all of the big labs are in the US, but at, at some point this will become a national security issue, right? I mean, there will probably be at some point in time a Manhattan project for AI where US government steps in and says like, okay, all of you labs, you need to work together because we need to beat China together. But it's yet again, you know, an, another arms race. And why all of this matters is because intelligence enable us to build like crazy new technologies. Like the only reason why we have don't have like stick and stones like bonobos, but you know, nuclear weapons and nuclear powers is because of these like incredible meat uh, computers like in uh, in 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 the middle of our ears. Um, but you know. We are by no means like the pinnacle of intelligence. So we're going to be able to build a lot of cool, amazing stuff, cure cancer, cure aging. Like, I don't know the timeline for these things, um, but, you know, we will be able to do those things. But we will also be able to build like really, really dangerous stuff. Like we will be able to build like engineered pandemics. We might be able to engineer pandemics that are just like affecting people of a certain like race and nationality. And that sort of stuff uh, worries me. Um, so we need to sort of coordinate around those global arms races. But to answer your question, how can this happen? I think it's, again, the interconnectedness of things. I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, I mean, the US were quick on export controls to China, saying we're not going to export the high-end GPUs that are needed to produce like advanced AI technology. And that is really making AI development a lot slower for China. But China, in turn, has a lot of leverage in the value chain as well. So China and its allies owns like 80% of all critical minerals that are needed to produce those chips in the first place. So, I mean, there could be a future point in time where China is saying, okay, like we want to double down here. You're not going to get access 
to our rare earth minerals. So try and build your GPUs now, like good, good luck. But hopefully that interconnectedness can be a surface for global collaboration, where it's like, you guys need us, we need you, let's create some sort of multinational AGI consortium where we you know, try to define what do we intrinsically value? What do we want this AI to do? What are the national security concerns? And we built this together for the benefit of all mankind. So that's like one way I could sort of see such a showdown uh, come down because of that interconnectedness. But with that interconnectedness, it feels to me that there's development happening outside of commercial use. So much of what we see as users of AI is the commercial form. There's no doubt in my mind that all of these advanced nation states have developed and put a lot of resources towards developing security-related AI use cases and weaponry advanced systems to protect, uh, detour, and ultimately become a, a weapon that they can unleash in conflict. Oh, yeah, 100%. And it's a multifaceted arms race. I mean, you might have seen like all of those videos floating around like of UAPs and, you know, might this be aliens, might it be this or that, but, you know, uh, and in some cases it might just be like a freaking duck and we have no idea what it is. But in other cases, it's like low cost drones and balloons from China, Russia, other places invading US airspace. I mean, the U.S. is doing the same thing against them because there's no countermeasures. Like, do you have a swarm of like low-cost drones? It, it's it's really easy. But I mean, the next evolution of that is just put a Faraday cage on it. There's no way you can jam it, make it completely autonomous and super low cost. Like, it's gonna be like, yeah, it, it it's gonna be a wild wild ride in the, in the next few few years. And that's like another point where we need to come together around like the lethal autonomous uh, weapons because they're there. And then, I mean, obviously the U.S. is, they rather have people believe that these are aliens than telling the truth that these are like low cost technologies and our airspace is being invaded all the time and we're not safe. Uh, that would be a much larger embarrassment. Looking at the research for this book, putting this together, where do you sit now in terms of optimism, pessimism around the future and the Doranian trap that faces humanity? I mean, it's hard to be an optimist sometimes. It is hard to be an optimist. I've, I've found that, you know, meditation helps in terms of being more of an <laughs> optimist. <laughs> or maybe I'm just like hacking my brain. There is this like psychological theory that actually people who are depressed are just realists. Then everyone who is not, not depressed is, 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 is just like delusional to some extent. Uh, but I don't think that is true. I don't think that is true. What brings me a great deal of optimism is how everything is interconnected. Like what, if you really think about it, is there one person with power? No, there's not. Like power is physically distributed in the world. So if we can just set up the governance systems for that distributed power, I think we're going to be fine. But we don't want to put like too much power in one single actor's hands. That, that's always a recipe for disaster. Well, thank you for ending us with optimism. Where can our audience find out more about the book, The Darwinian Trap, and the work that you do? Yeah, so you can uh, you can pre-order the book. It's going to be released on the 24th. It's going to be a great, you know, uh, birthday present or Christmas gift or a great read for, for yourself. So uh, please uh, pre-order it. Um, and I think like other related concepts like multipolar traps and Moloch, sort of this phenomena has like many other names. I'm far from the first person to sort of, you know, recognize that this is a huge problem. So you can just like Google it and find a bunch of material. Well, thank you for stopping by, Christian. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me.